All right, people, welcome again to Victory and Vices podcast. Me, Rory Spooner, James Veck, and Reese Henley. And we have a very special guest. Now, it's not often we have special guests. Not often we have footballing legends on either. But we have Mr. Warren Barton with us. Warren, thank you very much again for coming on. We very much appreciate your time. Um, probably the best question to start off with, mate, um, is how are you, given 2020 has been thrust upon us in the most, shall we say, unusual way? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me on. Um, it's always great to, to speak to fans, to people about the game, about the memories and, and obviously about what's going on at the moment. Yeah, we're, we're fine. I'm very, very lucky. I, I moved to San Diego in 08 with my family, three boys and my wife. And um, the climate here is wonderful. You know, we're not far from the ocean. Uh, but it's been tough, you know, work-wise. Uh, I've been working now with Fox Sports for a number of years. That's obviously been very much uh, eased down. Um, I like my coaching as well. I've been coaching my kids, uh, coach a little bit of LA Galaxy as well. Mm. Uh, that's been restricted. Um, it's been tough. But, you know, I wake up every morning, the sun's out, go for my walk. But, you know, there's a lot of people that are, are worse off than myself. But, you know, we're, we're lucky where we are. Uh, but it is tough for everybody. And I've got family, obviously, you know, back home in London, friends up in the Northeast. Uh, and we're all going through the same thing. So it's not just an isolated situation with one business or one environment. It's affected everybody. But, you know, it is tough. It is difficult. But we're getting through it. And, and hopefully, you know, the, the football keeps us occupied and keeps us focused uh, and gives us something to look forward to. Yeah, no doubt. Um, you touched upon, obviously, moving to America and you're doing the coaching side of things. Um, I don't know how accurate your Wikipedia is, so I figured I'd better speak to the man himself and ask, you know, job-wise how things is going. Um, so you're currently coaching um, and like a technical, uh, is it a technical director role for the, I'll try and get this right, the DMCV Sharks, is that correct? Correct. You know, the Americans love a brief creation, so it's Del yes. Mar Del Valley. So, I was lucky enough, um, you know, as I said, when I first come to the States to work at LA Galaxy in their academy in 08. But in between while I was uh, working with Fox and uh, I really enjoyed the media side. Um, you know, I've obviously got my coaching qualifications. Um, but I also had three young boys and that was the main reason for me and my wife to move over here because back in the UK, lots and lots of my friends have either gone into coaching, media and never see their kids. Um, and I wanted to be part of that, of, of them growing up. So they was 10, 8, and four when I first moved over here. Um, and by doing that in that EMB uh, Sharks, the little team uh, is actually run by a lady called Shannon McMillan. If you look at her in Wikipedia, she won a World Cup in 99 for the US national team. Okay. So uh, I wanted to coach for a, a person and be involved with someone that I respected. And with, with Shannon and I did, there's other clubs over here. Guys have got accents, said that they played in the Premier League, played for England and never did. Uh, but Shannon yeah. has got all the credentials and it gave me a chance to coach my kids, be in the environment, but also allow me to go and do my work up in Los Angeles with Fox. Uh, so, yeah, the Wikipedia is correct. I enjoy coaching. Good. It's coming to a point now where my kids are getting older. My youngest one 16, which is scary, and he's starting to drive. <laughs> so you know, he doesn't need daddy anymore. So, you know, there will be an opportunity. I, as I said, I did my... A license, pro license for people like Tony Adams, Stuart Pierce, Roy Keane, uh, Mick McCarthy, them type of people back in in, uh, in 07, 08, uh, doing my coaching qualification. So it's something that I would love to get into. Um, it's in my blood. I love I love doing it as much as the media has been great uh, and probably enjoyed that. But you know, I'm still a relatively young man. I'm, I've looked after myself. So I don't know. I say it now. I'd love to get into coaching, uh, but I might regret that in about 18 months' time. But um, yeah, it's it, it's wonderful to be able to coach your kids. The game is growing out here, boys and girls. You've seen, obviously, the influence of women's uh, football in the UK. In the, in the US, it's the roles reversed here. The US national team have been very, very successful globally, winning World Cups. The men's side is catching up, but it's getting there quickly with the facilities and everything else that's going on. So it's, a, it's quite a, an exciting time, obviously, until this bloody pandemic come along. The yeah. MLS was growing. So... You know, I've had the best of both worlds, and that was the whole point of being uh, in the U.S. to to be with my family, with my kids, but also, um, you know, get into U.S. soccer, as we call it now. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was meaning to ask you, uh, Warren, with with, uh, with the pandemic, um, how is things over there with the MLS? Is that because I saw it went, you know, shut down and then and then started back up again? Is are there are the fans going to be getting involved with that over there anytime soon or? It's a great question because, you know, America, until you live here, we, I mean, we see it over the pond, it's a big country, but until you live here, uh, I'll, little breakdown, I went on an RV trip with my family, which we would never, ever have done, but I highly, I highly recommend it. It was great to be with the family, but 
seven or eight days is enough. It, it was great. <laughs> we did the Grand Canyon up to Zion National Park, and we drove for like two days, three days, and we're still in the same state. You know, so that just shows you how how big it is. But what they did originally, obviously, once we got the okay, so it's like places like Florida, Texas, the Midwest, where the population is not so high, they was able to start. You know, the women's game started doing it. They went to Utah, started playing uh, in a bubble, but they was getting the league going. The mm. MLS then followed that shortly afterwards by going to Orlando and going into a bubble there to get the games going, to get playing to get the players in a condition. And then what they did, they let them go back out into their communities, but obviously in, in their own bubbles, uh, kept to their individual countries. So teams, you know, like Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, White Cups, they played against each other four or five times in their own country. Then the teams in New York on the East Coast did it. On the Pacific Northwest, they did it like Seattle, uh, Portland, LA, them type of teams, they kept together. And now they, they, they feel comfortable traveling now that they can start doing it so it was a knock-on effect that you know the women's game started first in utah went to the bubble that seemed to be fine i don't know whether you watch the nba but they've been doing yeah. it now in orlando and mm. it's been highly successful there uh, it takes a lot of discipline by the athletes because they can't go into shops here there and walk around um no fans at the moment but in the midwest where they've had some uh, sporting events at a lower level called usl uh, in louisville they've allowed 25 percent of the fans to go in the nfl a start in Kansas City did it with yeah. 25% going in there. So, I mean, the stadiums hold 80,000. So they're still letting 20,000 people in, but only in certain states and only in certain areas where the numbers are low, the death rates are low, the uh, spike is low and everything else. So unfortunately for California, because of its population with Los Angeles, Orange County, San Francisco, their numbers are relatively high compared to Orlando, Florida, you know, as I said, the Midwest. But they, they've started it up and now, actually yesterday, they put out the rest of the nine-game fixtures and they will be travelling further than they have been at the moment. But they don't want to put a full schedule out while everybody's travelling. So it's, it's a way of being on the TV. It's a way of it doing And obviously with our country, the UK, it's a lot smaller. Mm. So you can travel a lot easier. So it's, um, they are pushing, you know, to try and get a little bit of normality, which is... I think what we have to do, we've been really, really restricted for six months, seven months. I think as long as we can control it in a, in a controlled manner, it's never going to be 100%. But, you know, I think we should, look, particularly the lower league teams. You know, I'm a big fan of the grassroots football. That's why I come through with Dagenham and Redbridge. We've got to let these communities play. You've got to let them play and subsidise it with either money or letting a thousand people in just to try and get some normality for their mind, their mind sake more than anything else. Uh, because without fans in the lower league stadiums, I know I'm going off a little bit on your question, but we need to support them lower league teams. We need to, in these, in these yeah. smaller communities, we need to support the Premier League's fine, Championship's fine, you know, but we need to help these other clubs because if not, they fold. And I love the lower leagues. I love non-league. I've always said to the Americans, go, oh, I want to go to Old Trafford. I want to go there. I said, if you get a chance, go, go to Blythe Spartans or go to <laughs> go Wrexham or go to Dagenham and Redbridge. That's proper. Football, yeah. soccer, and the fans and the people, because it is, it's, it's volunteers that people, you know, it's part of their life. You know, Salford have done it with obviously the Man United boys and showing what you can do there. But it's, it's, it's a, a real big part of it. But the MLS is doing it. You know, they're going through till November the 11th um, and they're quite strong enough that they, uh, confident enough that they can see that through. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. obviously, on the, the, the fact that the fans are in as well, I mean, as an ex pro, Especially someone who's played up, you know, in Newcastle, uh, in St James's Park. How much, how much of an effect would that have on on the footballers not being able to play in front of fans on their performances and their mentality, things like that? Do you think it would have a big effect? I mean, I know it's not something that you've probably not experienced that much yourself, but you know, I think it's a great question. And you know, first and foremost, um, I think some play, and there's twofold here. I, I look at it myself, or Gary Speed, or Rob Lee, or Alan Shearer, Shaker. We love, we, we thrived in 52,000 screaming Geordies. We, we wanted that. We, we wanted that stadium to be full and have a waiting list of 10,000 people with the likes of Ginola and Asprio and, uh, and that was what's going on. So we thrived in that environment. I think with Newcastle in the luck towards the end of the season, with the pressure, with the cloud that was hanging over the, the, the club and the fans with the takeover and the, the dislike with maybe Steve Bruce and obviously Mike Ashley, I think it helped a lot of them players because... 
they was getting suffocated by the pressure, the intensity of what fans bring to the club. Um, I think what has happened as well for everybody is that, yeah, we know corporate's important. We know sponsorship's important. The TV money's important. But the fans are important as well because for players and for me, it would be, okay, one or two games like a pre-season game, you get motivated, people say, oh, you're professional as soon as you cross over that white line. But there's certain moments in a game that a fans can spur you on, can encourage you, can give you a kick up the backside. So I think, you know, players have, certain players have got away with it. And there's been a lot of conversation with the rookies in the NBA. They've flourished because there's no fans. There's no pressure <laughs> as such. So they've actually got great points. The guy at Miami Heat... Uh, yesterday got unbelievable figures, never been done before, because there's not that intensity. So I think some of the players have benefited from this to get confidence, to get belief, because they haven't got 52,000 fans paying for performances, passion, games, goals, that type of thing, um, and thrived on it. But it must be, like for me, I looked at it the other day, and it must be hard going into another season thinking about how you're going to be doing, motivating yourself going forward, because I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the fans. Um, and to answer your question as well, at Wimbledon at one point, a little quick story, me, we was playing Bolton at home um, at the early 90s, 92, 93. And me and a, a very good striker called Terry Gibson played for Tottenham Manchester United. A great little guy. Um, Danny DeVito, we used to call him as well. He does a lot of <laughs> guy at the moment in the league. A lovely, lovely fellow. But me and... Me and Terry, and obviously Terry played for Man United, and I was aiming to try and get to a big club, get a transfer to a Newcastle, Arsenal, that type of thing. And we counted in our warm-up how many fans was there. And there were 364 fans at 2.30 in the afternoon. And then flip that on the other side, you go up to St. James's Park for, for my first training session with David Ginola, Les Ferdinand, and, um, and myself and Shaka Hislop going to Maiden Castle. There's 5,000 people watching us train. So that was going from 364 fans to a warm-up. In the end, there was nine, I think there's 1,900 fans, which is a, a record, which is not something I'm proud of, but a low attendance is in the Premier League, Correct. to three months later, 5,000 people are just watching you train. And that's, that, that, was, you know, that, that was a difference yeah. straight away. So I have had the experience. I've played no, no, uh, lower league, non-league as well, to know when there's um, one man and a dog watching it, you know, places like Dulwich Hamlet and... And, and Yeovil when it first started but that, the problem is you can hear every word they're saying and uh, you know, it, can, it, it can obviously not be the nicest of words that they're saying particularly when you're a young blonde headed kid uh, that thinking that you're a good player so um, I've experienced a bit of everything which is, which is quite, quite amusing. Uh, on the subject of fans Warren um, obviously or the lack of fans rather at the moment we're seeing um, a few clubs, obviously, over in the UK struggling financially. Um, how is that sort of impacting clubs in the MLS or, or, or in the other US leagues or, or perhaps not impacting them at all? Are they does he run a lot differently to clubs over here or, or is it kind of a similar situation with some clubs there? No, I think it does affect uh, some of the clubs. But, uh, uh, Seattle, Atlanta, you know, 40,000, 50,000 they get. Atlanta have been, got the record of 60,000 people going to a stadium. Mm. So, you know, it, it, it has affected them financially. The, the difference is with them two franchises, they've got obviously one, Atlanta's got a wealthy um, billionaire that, that, that funds the Falcons and obviously uh, Atlanta as well. And it's great, you know, Stephen Glass, the next Newcastle player, he's the head coach there at the moment. So I wish them to do well. But so financially for them, it's a huge loss because their revenue, their shirts... Uh, the TV deals that they've got as well in the MLS is nowhere near as what we see in the Bundesliga, La Liga, and nowhere, obviously nowhere near the Premier League. So they do rely on the income and turnstiles. Clubs like a Dallas, a Houston, that don't get big attendances and they still have to have policing, stewarding, they're sort of quietly okay with it at the moment because they need to get eight, ten thousand to break even. Now they're not having to subsidise that they're all okay with the, the level of, of financial for this year. You know, they may be able to get through with it this year. Obviously, if it goes on and we never know what's going to happen uh, in, in the future, but some of them can actually benefit from it and not be too concerned. But the bigger ones, as I said, Seattle, Atlanta, they sort of can get away with it short term. But obviously, you know, the government are trying to step in to help. Um, you know, I see with Tottenham where they, you know, was cutting people's salaries straight away. 
the players stepped up to do that. They've done that type of thing in, in the MLS, the NBA, uh, and Major League Baseball as well. So there's been a lot of that togetherness to try and keep people in the jobs. But yeah, it, ha it will have a knock-on effect, you know, and it, it will be maybe not so much now, but when we go into, you know, 21, 22, that, that type of thing where we might see the impact that comes into it. Yeah, interesting you talk about, obviously, how football or soccer for an American audience that hopefully tunes in is watching. The, um, the growth is, is, you know, getting bigger and bigger every year. I wanted to touch upon a few of the younger players. For example, obviously Pulisic, he left um, you know, the States to go to Dortmund at a young age. Uh, Serginho Dest is potentially on his way to Barcelona now as well. Uh, Conrad, De L uh, I think it's uh, De La Fuente, he's at Barcelona. Uh, Weston McKenney became the first Juventus, uh, American, I'm sorry, to play for Juventus, I beg your pardon. Um, Tyler Adams, obviously very impressive for Leipzig as well. Do you feel like the MLS is set up for younger players to thrive or are they better going abroad at a younger age to get their education? You know, when I spoke about being with the LA Galaxy uh, way back when Rude Hullet was there and then uh, Bruce Arena come in, you know, the, the influx of obviously the academy coming into the clubs was meant to enhance the players, to bring them through. The problem you had with some of the coaches is that they still wanted them to go to college, like a Jordan Morrison, who's at um, yeah. Seattle, who's, he didn't come back until he was 21, 22 from, from college, went to Stanford, got a great education. So in America, uh, you know, in the 08, 09, 010, it was still seen to go to academy to go to college. It was mm -hmm. like, a, get me to college, get me to a, a, a college so I can get an education. And if I can play a bit of soccer afterwards, that'd be great. That'd be fine. The likes of Christian Pulisic with his dad, who was an indoor soccer player, and Tyler Adams, that sort of generation was like, no, I want to be a pro. I, wanna, I, wanna, I don't want to go to college. It's great, but I can see the avenue of going. And, and unfortunately, at that time, that's when they was going off to, to Europe. Flipping it forward now, you know, 10 years later, you've got 60, 70% of the kids, particularly Dallas, do a really good job of young players, of getting them into being professionals. They want to be a pro. They want, they're not so interested now. In the UK, it's all about going to, being at the academy and being a pro school at the end of it I've done that I've played, I, went, I went to secondary school and now I'm in the big world and I, I yeah. want to go and play or I'll go and get a trade and, and go from there I know it's slightly changing a little bit in England but the American was much more academy as a showcase for me to get into college these type of players have, have left to go forward the problem we're getting now with the academy in the MLS and it's a great point that, that you made is that the stakes have gone up in the MLS it's 25 years uh, now it's been going but people are wanting to win and, and LAFC and LA Galaxy played the other day that are legitimately supposed to have good academies LAFC had one American player Galaxy had three so what Don Garber was trying to do who's the commissioner of MLS was 10 years ago we want to have five or six American players in each team mm. but because of the stakes are high in players they're going off to South America and buying kids young talented from Boca Juniors from Paraguay, you know, that are getting Almiron, who's gone to Newcastle, get him in 1920, train him, and then sell him for $25 million. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as much as they want to try and bring forward, the academies are still great here. There's lots of good academies. It's an avenue. A lot of them are trying to be players. But the problem they're getting now, a knock-on effect, is that the, the MLS coaches are not bringing them through because they're under pressure. So what's happening, a lot of them are having to drop to another league, which is called USL, yeah. And again, the problem you're getting with them is a lot of them are independently owned and they want to be successful. So they don't really see, why should I take a 17-year-old kid from LAFC, coach him, nurture him, and then LAFC benefit from that? They want to they be successful, like Phoenix Rising, where Didier Dropper played and mm. um, you know, Rambo played, and Paul, Paul Ramage is at Newcastle now as the under-23 coach. He earned a living out here doing it. So... You know, it's harder now for the, the American players to come through. So a lot of them, are, uh, particularly the German league, the Bundesliga, because a lot of families have got servicemen of, you know, family, uh, parents that have worked in Germany, then they can get them into the country to, to do that. So that's why the Bundesliga, and particularly Bayern Munich, have gone over and trying to pick out a Christian Pulis, a Tyler Adams, a Weston McKinney, you know, as you rightly said, to, to get them at 15, 16 uh, and even the, the Canadian young boy, Alfonso Davis, who went yeah. to went went to from Vancouver for twelve million uh, and took his chance, you know. And um, so there is opportunity. There's more opportunities there was ten years ago, but you now you're getting a little, which is 
to be fair, what every other country in the world is, is that to get in the first team, you've got to push yourself because they've got scouting systems all over the world. Um, but the MLS, is, again, it's quite, in hindsight, well, it was meant for younger players to come through, mm. but we're not getting too many of them now uh, because the stakes are, are so high making the playoff. And as I said, you've got these billionaires, not millionaires, billionaires that want to be in the playoff, want to win the, uh, the MLS Cup. So the stakes have got higher for the, the first team coaches and, and they're feeling the pressure. Yeah. Is there a particular talent that you would recommend, one that's maybe not necessarily over in Europe right now? So if you were recommending a talent to a UK coach, you'd say, you need to take a look at this guy. Is there a particular one that sort of stood out to you recently? Yeah, Jordan Morris has always been consistently good and he's been linked with moving away when he was younger, but he didn't want to go when he was younger. Now he's got to a say of 23, 24. He got over a bad ACL injury a couple of years ago. He can fit the bill. Uh, Paxton, a young boy at uh, t- um, Chicago, he's another good player uh, that are coming through. But as I said, a lot of them are getting picked up um, by these German clubs when they're in the under twenty, you know, under eighteens, under seventeens. So there's, there is plenty of young players, and again, it's not necessarily all American young players. You've got good South American players, and I had a conversation with Dennis Wise back in '08 when he was at Newcastle. He said, "Look." I'm moving over, Dennis. Um, if you need anybody to look at young players, I've been, I would do it for free. I'd, I'd do it for Newcastle. Anything I can help. And he went, no, you're okay, Warren. We've got a guy in Texas. We're relying on him. I said, well, who's the guy? And he said, oh, just a friend. And I've never heard anything since. So, you know, I, I'm not saying that I would identify, but I'd seen Alfonso Davis when he was 15 years of age. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to say that he's quick, direct and pacey. You can learn the rest. Um, yeah. and no surprise that he's gone on and, and done well. So it just takes someone who's got an eye to, to do it, and again, someone that you you respect enough to do it as well. But yeah, it, that's. But there is a lot of good young players out here. Do they need to develop better? Yeah, of course they do. There, there's, there's no doubt about that. And more importantly, you need to be giving them a chance. You know, the kid Long, uh, who's at LA, uh, uh, Red Bulls, the centre yeah. half, he's 23, 24. A couple, few clubs have looked at him. But he needs to work on things, you know, and that's where I think, you know, what before you say, right, I want to go and spend 10 million. OK, you're going to get him, but he needs to work on this, this and this. So, you know, but there's, there's talent everywhere. You know, there's, you know, like I said, whether it's lower league like a, a Vardy or over in the MLS, there's good young players around. Yeah. No, they just need to be coached on it by the right people. I, I was going to ask... Um, Obviously, from your days over at Newcastle, I mean, you you, you would have been coached around about the time uh, where Sir Bobby Robertson was there. Um, I just want, want, wondered what was, you know, everyone always talks about Sir Bobby Robertson in such a high regard, and rightly so. What was there? Have you, have you, have you got any stories about the man or, or anything specifically that there was about him that was, you know, so special? Have you have you seen the documentary about Bobby? Have you watched on, on the I've on seen the, I've seen the Just Call Me Bobby one. Yeah, if you do, that's everything about Bobby. What you see there. For me, and I think for a lot of people as well that I play with, uh, you know, the likes of Rob and Alan, he was the best. He was the best in the sense of KK was wonderful with the media and when we was doing well. Um, you know, you've had other people like Terry Venables when I had him with England. Tactically, Terry was great. Uh, very old school, but the, the tactical side. So Bobby was a mixture of everything. He was a gentleman. He loved the game and respected it. He, he, liked, he loved being around players, so that made you as a player want to play for him. His man management skills was brilliant. You know, when we had, say, an international break or the FA Cup, he'd get the British lads knowing what we're like and say, right, I'm going to take you off and play a bit of golf in Dublin or up in St Andrews. So we was all great. But he would let the foreign lads, like Nikos, uh, not so much Nobby Solano because obviously he was in South America, but he would let the foreign players, for Stoney, go back to Europe for four days. So they was happy. We was all happy because I didn't want to keep walking around the, the, the shopping centre with my wife. I'd love to have a game and get on beat with the boys. <laughs> and, yeah. So we would do that. And the foreign players, so he just knew how to tick everybody's boxes and just tactically as well. He knew, you know, he would get the best out of people. You know, wonderful stories. And, you know, one thing about Bobby was always about names and they did it with Brian Robson. And, you know, when he called me Brian, he went, no, no. You know, you're, he called it Brian Robson. Bobby he said, no, no, Gaffer, you're, you're Bobby, I'm Brian Robson. So that was when I was at the together. <laughs> and when we played out in Bulgaria, in Sofia, you know, he put a team sheet out. And I was, you know, playing well. As he said, one of the blue chip players. And he threw Barton down at right back and, and Warren down at left back. And we just let it go. And he said, right, Barton, I want you to get forward there. You've been doing, you've been great. Make sure you give it to Nobby and tuck round. 
and Warren, you do this. I said, yeah. I know I'm doing well, but I think <laughs> yeah. and he was uh, crossing it out and he'd have, he'd have a go at John Carver or Mick Wadsworth. And, but he was just brilliant, you know, just great uh, management. You know, when, we, when he first came in from Rouge, you know, when the, the dressing room was divided, not by the players, but just by Rude Hullet and the way he tried to cause anarchy in front of it, you know, pushing Alan mm-hmm. out, Bob Lee out, Stuart Pearce out, Nick Estabizaz out. And, you know, they're my friends. Um, you know, I know I'm professional and I've played out there and I was still captain of the club, but that was my mate, you know, and I didn't think it was right with the way he was being treated. Um, so when Bobby came in on the Thursday after we lost to Sunderland on the, the Tuesday, I think it was, and we should have, you know, in an ideal world, tried to get Bobby after KK. And I think, you know, things would have been a lot smoother and a lot easier. Um, but he turned around straight away and he said to Alan in the, in the group, and um, I was just pleased when he went round, that, you know, shaking everybody's hands that he knew my name. He said, oh, I Warren, pleasure to meet you. So I went to Gary, oh, yeah, he knows my name, he's great. <laughs> I've, got a chance, I've got a chance to play. And I mean, this guy had been in PSV, Porto, uh, Barcelona, the England team and, and everything. And so he's got millions of names, but he, you know, he's good enough to, again, to know. And he said, Alan, he said, why do you keep facing, in front of all of us, you know, why do you keep facing for the ball? And, and Alan, in his, in his way, went, oh, well, that idiot told me to keep showing for the ball. I said, I want you to face that way. That's where the goal is. I want you to face that way. So that was it. He said, go on, boys, have a little warm around. Done that. Went out on Saturday. We won 8-0 against Sheffield Wednesday. Alan got five goals <laughs> facing that way. Um, and again, which was, you know, just so simple but so effective and made us and Alan realise we want you facing that way. We want you going towards goal. Uh, and he goes on and gets, you know, 260 goals in the Premier League, which I, I don't think is ever going to be beaten. So it, just the way he was with people, um, you know, we'd be in a hotel, he'd let people walk out. It was just everything you want to be as a person. He had a wicked side to him, an evil side. Me and Rob Lee, you know, when we was, Rob was 35, I was 33, he was like, you know, you're, you're getting old and you've got to go. And, and I was like, and it wasn't until about two or three years later, I was like, no, Rob, he was, he was right. We was ready to move on at that time. And the team went back in the Champions League. You know, me and Rob had had great careers and thoroughly enjoyed it. But it was, it was the right time. Genus come in. Aaron Hughes was ready to take over. Bellamy was playing. Dyer was playing. Robert was coming in. Uh, Jonathan Woodgate was coming. So, you know, the, the, it was ready for the team to evolve. And he just knew, a bit like Sir Alex, when to get rid of us. Because, you know, I was three months before and I was still captain. Uh, and when Alan was injured, so I was playing and, and he just said, you know, uh, you can stay and you won't play as lot. And or if not, you know, take the opportunity. So I went off to Derby for two and a half years because I wanted to still play. I loved the game and I wanted to play. But deep down where he wanted to go, it was the right thing to do for the club. Um, and, it, you know, I, I totally understand it. And I told him afterwards when I see it, I said, he's a bloody sod, but you, you was right because... I wanted to play, and I said, I know, Warren, but at the end of the day, I'm looking ahead, and I said, okay, I respect that. From him. And I said, we, I miss him every day. I, you know, he was great for me, not just because I played for him, but I respected everything he did, the way he was with the security guys at the office, the way he was when we walked into the canteen, you know, no pushing and shoving. Like, we don't see that anymore. We don't see it anymore. And it may, people may think it's old school and it's a bit silly, but it was part of what made us a professional team and made the team get back in the Champions League by having discipline on and off the field. And he was, as I said, he was brilliant. He had a mixture of everything. And uh, he's, he's, the game is sorely missed uh, because he was, he was the right thing how the game was. Um, and as I said, he was, at my time, I learned so much off of him. Not only as coaching, uh, but as I said, as, as being a proper human being. Um, so, yeah, a great, great guy. I was lucky as well because Kenny Dalglish was brilliant in his own way. Rude was rude. It tactically was good, but man management, you know, wasn't his strong point to say the least. But you know, Bobby was was brilliant as, as KK was as well. Yeah. What was it? What was it about Rude that was what was so prickly? He on- the name Rude. He, he just <laughs> that, like I said, you know, he wouldn't. It was about you know, the only person I know you go in his office and normally you have a picture of your dog or your family or what. It was a picture of him. So, and Rube was great. You know what I mean? Rube, can I just say, the player and ta- we played uh, Reading when we opened their stadium, and we was awful in pre season. So, he said to Tomo, the kit man, who's actually still there, have you got any boots and give him a shirt? He went on and passed the ball everywhere, and he was brilliant. But it was his man's management skill, how he was, you know, when he left Alan out, he didn't tell him. He got, he got Steve Clark to do it, who was shaking in his boots. They had to tell Alan Shearer, you're not playing against Sunderland at St. James's Park. He didn't have 
the balls to go and tell him because his words were, which he said to me and Steve Howie and, and, and Speedo, well, no one told me when, you got, when I got dropped. And I went, with all due respect, Reed, you was World Player of the Year or European Player of the Year twice. Whoever told you you weren't playing? <laughs> he went, yeah, yeah, baby, that's a good point. I said, but this is Alan Shearer. You've got to, if you're not going to play him, at least tell him you're not going to play him. Don't pass the buck. And a small thing, you know, which is a big thing for me, you know, when he said about Sunderland, Newcastle, it's a regional derby. That's when he didn't get it. He didn't get what Newcastle was. And it's, you know, he went to Galaxy and did the same thing. You know, Lexi Lallis, who I speak to, he was on the golf course. He'd give Lexi a list of, of players that he wanted. And it was like, no, no, Root, this, you have to go to the drafts. You have to look at people. You have to, you actually have to work, you know. Yeah. Um, and, it, you know, and that's where, you know, Root fell short of not understanding what Newcastle was. Not understanding what you know, it means to play for that club in that area for that group of fans. And, and it, you know, people will say it's the same for everybody, but it ain't, you know, it's not. You know, Leeds possibly because it's a huge club and it's great for them to be back in the Premier League. But, you know, being in the North East and, and, and no, being a Southerner, being in the North East, to appreciate what it is and understand it was important for me to be a professional at Newcastle and to understand that. And, you know, people like Lee Clark or Steve Watson or Peter Beersley, they told me that from day one and I got it. It, it fell in my mindset. It was like, I got it. I can't, as much as I, particularly I didn't really know Kevin Ball or Mickey or the Quinney or any of them or Kevin Phillips, but I didn't like them and they didn't like me. So that's fine, you know, and, but it was mutual respect and that's how it was. And that's how it still is now. You know, I, I see Mickey Gray not as often as I'd love to, but when we have seen each other, it's like, I used to love kicking you and he said, I love eating you. But it was done in the right way. And at the end, it was like, you know what? It was part of being in that North East. You know, it wasn't just another game. It, you know, it, it was a special. And that's what Rude didn't understand and didn't get. Did that, and, and did playing, obviously, your football at Wimbledon beforehand, did that sort of, not that you needed toughening up, but did it sort of instill that kind of, you know, mentality into you? Playing with oh, yeah, it was brilliant. I mean, for, for Wimbledon to go there as a young boy, I mean, one of the best things for me, and I think you asked Stuart Pearce, Chrissy Waddle, uh, Ian Wright, was playing non-league. When I was 16, you know, a little rat, really, blonde hair, thought I was the, the best thing you know, i come out of a boy band, going into a changing room, and you've got an electrician, a plumber, a policeman, whatever it is, and if you lose the game, and at the time, £5 for a bonus or £10 for a bonus they was going to let you know that you, you let them down because that five pound was going to be their night out or take their wife out for dinner or I'm talking about in the eighties. So going from there, non-league to Wimbledon was actually a, another step of realizing that, that togetherness, you know, that belief. I remember early on in my career, lucky enough for Wimbledon, I've been playing reasonably well. I hit the ground running, got selected for England and I was all in the papers and, you know, Graham Taylor had selected me and I'm going in training and passing the ball around. And John Fashion, you just clotheslined me right across my throat like that and said, settle down, settle down. You haven't made it yet. This is about the club. It's about Wimbledon. And we would win games in the tunnel. I'm not saying it's right, but we would win it with Fash or Vinny. And any time there was a, a, a to-do, I mean, Arsenal at the time, they had strong characters. Uh, and we would, we would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them and, and beat them. And in my time, we finished like seven, eight, six for one season. I mean, a team like Wimbledon finishing six. It was incredible because every year they would say their best player. So for me to understand being at Wimbledon, that togetherness, sticking together, you know, when Sir Alex Ferguson put it in his book and said that when I, when we went down to uh, Cantona's volley that he scored in a night game, and we, we tried every trick in the book to try and disrupt him. He said when they stood up to us, they knew they would go and win the title. Not because they were better than us, because they knew they were better than us on the football field. And they had people like... Paul Ince, Brian Robson, Roy Keane was coming through, Dennis Irwin, Steve Bruce. They had some Mark Hughes. They could look after themselves. But until that lot stood up against us, and, and, and which they did, and beat us, then he knew they would win the title. And then he knew we could bring the younger players through because they had that mentality. And, you know, that's a, that's a compliment in itself. Um, was, it, was it pretty on the eye? No, but it was, it was bloody fun to play. It was, you know, when you play a... Stoke, or, it's not so much Stoke, but Norwich or Southampton, you know, they wanted to play and be, the, you know, they'd always get some Norwegian or some, scan oh, Wimbledon, it's not the crazy gang. And in the first 15 minutes, you'd hear, ah, and he'd be on the floor and you know, we would have won the game. And, you know, we, we knew we could get to 
40, 50 points by just doing that. And then we had good players, you know, you like some, you know, Dean Holdsworth, Robbie Earl, myself, John Scowls, um, you know, had gone on to get, you know, good careers, Chris Perry, you know, people like that, Neil Sullivan. Uh, there was a conveyor belt of, of good players coming along. But it, it, as I said, it was fun to play again. I don't know whether VAR would help Wimbledon <laughs> at, at, at this time. <laughs> I think Wimbledon, might, we might be playing with about six players. Yeah. Go, oh, on. Go on, Go on. Um, I was just going to say, you mentioned obviously um, at Wimbledon and, and playing with the with Crazy Gang, and which you had quite a, a style change with Newcastle. You went and played with the entertainers, I saw they were known as. How did you um, kind of deal with the step up from a club like Wimbledon, going to a club not only the size of Newcastle, but then playing with the type of plays you did there and, and, and the opposing style, if you wish, to what you were used to at Wimbledon? Yeah, I think, you know, at Wimbledon, and again, another thing, I put it in a paper that we could play, and Vinny put me in my place and said, look, don't say that because we don't want people to believe that we had some actually technically good players. So, you know, again, it was undermining it. But we, we could play it a little bit. I'm not saying that we was total football and it was brilliant. But I remember doing a cool down with Robbie Oak uh, at the time, a very good friend of mine. And we was doing some stretching afterwards in a cool down. And St. James's Park was empty. And Wimbledon had just lost the game. And uh, the, the atmosphere was brilliant. And I said, Can you imagine playing for this stuff? You know, and at the time, I was linked with Celtic, Everton, Sheffield Wednesday. I'd spoken to David Dean. I was always on my way to Blackburn with Kenny Dalgleish. I, was, I got a phone call. But I just I remember saying to Robbie, imagine you know, playing in front of this lot. And then we went back to the Gosford Park and, and Arthur Cox was there. And we were just talking about football. And it wasn't, he wasn't recruiting me or anything else. He was saying about this club, the fans. So when that phone call came from KK and, my, um, and uh, Joe Kinnear at the time just said, we've got to go and meet Kevin Keegan. It was all in, a seed was in the back of my mind to go and play for that, you know, the fans, the atmosphere, how they play, you know, and the, the style of football. I've been around England squad for 18 months with the likes of Rob Lee, Steve Howey, and, and ultimately, probably one of the best players I've ever played with, Peter Beardsley. So you could see what was going on. And, and Barry Venison at the time as well, he'd just got into the England squad, although he was a lot older. Venners was telling me about it as well. And I was actually probably going to take Barry's place, but that's how much he... He wanted a club. It was great. You love it. The city, it's vibrant. The style of football, you you adapt to it well. You're a good athlete. They can pass a move. So the actual move was easy uh, going forward. And as I said, the expectation of 5,000 people were watching you train. But I do remember saying to Les after, and, and me and Les was the same at QPR, after about a week, 10 days, I said, do you ever touch the ball in training when they're doing the eight aside? He went, Oh, no, I'm the same way with Barza. I never get hold of the ball, you know. It's pinging and it took us a bit of time because I said to Kevin, we're not, we're not touching the ball. It's flying around everywhere. And me and Paul O'Leary are like, no, it's not, we're not used to playing as quick as that. But we would train how we would play and then you get into it and then you're playing with players that would just, uh, you'd make a run and they would find you. And, you know, the touch off of, you know, someone like a Ginola or, you know, a Les Fern. And then it just snowballed onto it. And obviously then we hit the ground running um, and then it come easy, you know, and then it be, it become easy. But yeah, from going from the crazy game to an entertainer, it took a bit of adjustment, but it was just wanting to do it. And I remember saying to Kevin, we beat Stoke and probably one of my better games earlier on in my time at Newcastle, we beat Stoke in a cup, four or five nil. And I said, Gaffer, I feel like I can do more. You know, at Wimbledon, I was doing a lot more than what I was. He said, just do your job. Just do your job and everything else. You've got Keith Gillespie, just pull it in the channel and air cross it and that and... There's a score, and if not, hit a diagonal to David, uh, and if and here chest it and run and cross it. If you're in doubt, just give it to Rob Lee or Peter Beardsley from five six yards away. They do the rest, and it was like, okay, <laughs> that's quite simple, um, and that that was it, you know. And as I said, it was it, it was fun to be with, and um, you know, it, it it was great. But yeah, you feel like I mean, I want to do more. I want to. You don't have to when you've got players like that around you. Like he said, just do your job. Um, and, and we did it to uh, to good effect for, for almost almost the, the entire season, which still haunts me to this day. <laughs> yeah, do you know going back? I read an article earlier on that you said the uh, the title loss in '96 is that it sort of it haunts you to this day. Is that your biggest regret in football that that you didn't get over the line? Yeah, no, no, no doubt, no, no doubt, and it not not for me, but for the people in in the northeast. When I look at you know the Premier League now and Leicester. Blackburn, you know, Liverpool now after 30 years, um, 
we should have been up there. You know, we, we have to take responsibility as players. United game when Cantona scored, maybe hindsight, which is a great thing, is that we should not have lost that game. We battered them in the first 45 minutes. The half-time team talk should have been, we don't lose this game. If we can win it, great, but we ain't losing this game because there's still seven or eight points away from us. Um, but it was, let's go and show them again. Let's show them how good we are. And we got the sucker punch. Michael saved it. Cantona scored. And that's when it, we lost our momentum uh, and lost our, maybe lost our belief and started questioning ourselves. It wasn't the Man City game or the West Ham game, in my opinion, or the 4-3 against Liverpool. That was the one that, that put the seed in our mind um, about what, what was going on. And again, it, from this day, it still haunts you because, you know, yes, at 13, at 16, I was told I was too small, never going to make it. And you play in the Champions League, you play in cup finals, you play for England uh, and you get two runners-up, or you don't even get a medal for runners-up, but you get two two years we was runners-up uh, in the FA Cup and obviously in the, the Premier League. But that's, you know, I'm still disappointed because that was the one for the fans that they could have had that. And like I said, if that would have happened, again, hindsight, you know, maybe KK don't leave, you get Allen in, we do what Chelsea did, and we keep going forward. But, it, you know, it's not. It may be what makes the story so romantic and so cutthroat because it's, it's, you could taste it, you could feel it, um, but also you could feel the sand going through your fingers when you, we were trying everything, you know, KK, different formations, we lost our shape, we lost the momentum and, and in the end, you know, they, they, they won it. Um, but yeah, it still haunts me, as you can tell by <laughs> knowing every 25 years later, you know, it's, it's a kick up the nuts and uh, it's one that would disappoint me for uh, uh, until I'm not here anymore. Yeah, yeah you are. This, this this podcast is essentially two United fans who are these two, and a Newcastle fan of myself. So that's that's fair to say there's mixed mixed feelings on that one, Warren. Um, but with with regards to that season as a whole, it, it, it's hard to argue that's probably the best Premier League season Newcastle have ever had. So um, it's definitely mixed feelings on that one, especially as someone who's probably a bit too young to have, to have watched it, you know, in its entirety. But you know, in that dressing room, that team that you had that year, there were so many huge characters. I mean, going around those years as well, there was uh, Faustino Asprea as well, uh, a few more. I, I, there's a few crazy stories playing around about Faustino Asprea and, and his house party, isn't it? When you were saying a bit, a bit earlier on to me. Um, is there any stories that you had about those? Yeah, but I don't know whether I can repeat them. But yeah, you're right. At that time, you know, the even the granddad collars. I know that makes me feel old when you say you're not old enough to remember. But you know, the granddad <laughs> collars um, that they had. You know, ten thousand people at twelve o'clock at night queuing up at the the store to buy a shirt. You know, things that probably will never happen again in the northeast, where you know the city was being built. There was hotels. There was restaurants. And we was part of that. We was part of that city being popular. And the northeast in general. You know. As much as we dislike uh, the Smoggies and, and, and the Mackhams, it was great that they was in the Premier League. We was playing against them. It was great for the region. Uh, you know, Brian Robson, what he was doing, and Peter Reid. You know, big, big, big personalities that would be in the North East and, and, and making it buoyant. And to, you're right, and have someone like a, a David Ginola playing, a Les Ferdinand, a Tino Esprit, a David Batty, you know, Rob Lee, all big characters that could, you know, that one could play but also knew, you know, you looked at the United team that they had. They were people that, you know, could dig in and, and put their self about and, and win, a, win a game ugly. Uh, and the likes of Arsenal were their invincibles, you know. But, you know, with Tino, he was a, he was a one-off. At home, he was, he was brilliant. And, you know, the performance against Barcelona epitomises what Tino would do. I mean, Keith Gillespie, arguably his best performance in a, in a black and white shirt. He was phenomenal that night. Uh, and Tino obviously take all the accolades, scoring a hat-trick. Not just a hat trick in the Premier League, sorry, in the in the Champions League for the first time, but doing it against a Barcelona with Figo, Moraldo, you know, uh, Luis Enrique, um, you know, top class players. Um, but yeah, with Tino with his house parties, there was legendary. You know, you'd go there and you know, all of a sudden he he would start the music would start going, he would start singing, and he had this purple uh, shagpole carpet that was there and. He was just a great guy, you know, just a party guy. And anyone following on social media now, he's even better then. He's put yeah. on a few pounds, to say the least, but he, he looks great. And, you know, lots and lots of stories and, you know, the way he used to train. And, we, as I said, Philip Albert, another big character, Pavel Cernicek, uh, 
um, you know, Gary's speed, you know, there's all good characters, you know, and Gary would drive us all mad, playing his wonder world, he's learning the guitar, but for three years, it was just the same keys that he was playing, and, you know, Nobby would go around the, the hotel, Nobby Solano, 11 o'clock at night, playing the trumpet, you know, we were all trying to go to bed, and he would phone up and start playing the trumpet, but come Saturday, or a Tuesday, or a Sunday, or a Monday, we, we was ready to play, I'm not saying we won every game, but Whoever we played against, they knew it was a, it was going to be a tough game. But yeah, lo lots of lots of fun, lots of you know good times in training. You know, we used to you know get to training at eight thirty, nine o'clock in the morning, just to be with each other, just to have breakfast, a cup of tea, and chat. And then training was at ten thirty. So yeah, it, it was a great great time of our lives. And I think you ask anybody, you know, we we thoroughly enjoyed it. We mixed off the field with the wives and the kids because uh, we was all that similar sort of age with the likes of Shay and. Aaron Hughes that was younger players, they would come with us. So, you know, it, it, was a, it was a great time. But yeah, lots of good stories, but I'm going to keep them and, until I write a book or something. Because uh, <laughs> yeah. he and I get here and start get, shooting me with one of his guns. It deserves a Netflix documentary. That's what it deserves. I would love to see it. I would absolutely oh, love to see yeah, it. It would, be. it would be. And it'd be about four series long. It'd be <laughs> like uh, Johnny Exotic, it'd be one of them. So it'd be fun. It'd be fun. You um you spoke about him um very briefly. Sorry, Becky, to cut you off there. Um, and you talk uh, about Gary Speed now, and you, you mentioned obviously how tight knit everyone was. His untimely death was just so tragic for Welsh football, and it, it kind of impacted Welsh football in a real negative way, but in a real positive way as well, because they tried to use his passing as 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 momentum almost to kind of move forward and, and, and sort of bring forward you know younger players and, and continue the good things he was doing. As such a, a tight knit group, how did his passing impact on all of you? How did you take it on? Oh, it was devastated. Um, you know, I was I shared a room with Gary for four years. Um, and although he drove me mad with his stupid guitar and his his silly you know, his silly laugh that he had. Um, if I wanted to go anywhere on the field, play anywhere, he would be the first one I'd pick. Uh, and the same yeah. with what Alan said. He was a great professional, you know, still now keeping contact with Tommy and Eddie's kids uh, and Louise, his wife at the time. Um, and we were just devastated. I, couldn't, I was working with Fox. I got the, the, the text message and got the, I couldn't believe it. Uh, I cried my eyes out for two or three days. Then I got angry um, with him because mm. he had everything, you know, and it, it was an illness or whatever it was. Uh, I still, to this day, we don't know. Um, but you couldn't meet a better player. And it, it hit someone like Craig Bellamy very hard. You know, Ryan yeah. Giggs, uh, Big Norman uh, as well. The, you know, Norman Pope, the, the wonderful goalkeeper. And Norman would phone him up and speed up, be laughing. But Norman was just a, a funny, funny guy. And he had that, you know, that, you know, that Welsh accent. And the, you know, we'd call him Taff and, and things yeah. like that. We'd have a laugh about it all. And just a great, great person. Um, still miss now, you know. You know, it was his birthday a little while ago, and still can't get your head around it that you know he did that. You know, and obviously Pavel Sonacek, another good friend of ours, and he went far, far too early. Mm -hmm. uh, but with, with Gary, you know, and Gordon Strachan said it, and uh, Gary McAllister as well, we couldn't see it, you know. And Alan spent time with him doing on TV and and being around, and nothing. There was nothing. He never got nervous before games. He never got. Worried about thinking he had a you know beautiful family, you know, great kids, he, his mum and dad, and you, you just couldn't believe it. You couldn't believe it. And you know, the more you talk about it, the more it upsets you and, mm. and things then you get angry with him because he didn't need to do it. Why didn't he speak to me? Or why didn't he speak to even when I was five thousand miles away and we would text each other like on a Friday or a Thursday, how you doing? And particularly how well he was doing with Wells and Aaron Ramsey, I remember we had a good conversation with Aaron. He said, you watch this kid, he's going to be a hell of a player. And just talking about the young players and how much he loved his job. And he, listen, he was Welsh through and through and patriotic about his country. And we, as I said, we'd have a lot of fun about the Welsh, the Irish and the Scots and everything else. And that's part of, of us, you know, and that's part of what we, we are, part of the British Islands. And for him, uh, it was everything to play for his country and then to manage it. So it, to comprehend what had gone on... I can't, and I don't think anyone can. Uh, only he knows. Um, yeah. It'd be solid miss because he was one hell of a player as well. Uh, not only for Newcastle, but for, for when he went to Bolton at the end. He was one of the fittest guys for his age, Everton, obviously. And I remember playing when I 
we grew up in the Premier League, me and Speed Oak, because when he was at Ellen Road with Leeds, they'd hit that bloody long diagonal from Mel Sterling and Speedo would come from the side and I can head it. He had the good looks, the curly hair. I remember doing the commercials for Top Man and things like that. You know, he was, he had everything. And, you know, for him not to be here um, is a crying shame. Um, but, I, you know, again, I can't yeah. speak highly of him. And he was a, not only, as I said, a teammate, he, he was my friend. Um, and I feel a bit guilty sometimes, if I'm being honest, because... Why didn't I see it? How, how did I not know it was going on or, or whatever, you know? But it, it is what it is. And me and Louise yeah. have spoken. Candy's really good. My wife is good friends with Lou. Um, and, you know, we're, we're never going to know. We're never going to know. But I can't, as I said, I can't speak highly about him. I loved him to death. He drove me mad. We'd argue every time in training. But that was part of being, you know, friends, brothers, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it's a beautiful yeah. take. It's a beautiful take. Yeah, we um obviously speaking of great players, as we just mentioned about Gary Speed there, um sort of ending more towards a, a happier note, so to speak. Um, what we always like to do, Warren, is um is ask guests such as yourself, um, to tell us about their all time eleven or best eleven. I don't know if this is something that you've done before, but putting you on the spot a little bit. Um, obviously, be interested to know who would manage this eleven as well. The formation is obviously up to you, but um, we'll probably make people that I play with? Is it yeah. people that I play with? Yeah. Okay, so it's people yeah. that I play with, not my best eleven ever. Um, That's right. Yeah. Okay. So you can play left and right back as well. Okay. Well, yeah. Am I playing a, a Mike Bassett a four four? Over <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. If you want, yeah, yeah. I watched that the other day. That that made me talking about light-hearted. I watched that again. It's hilarious. It's great. It's great. Man. It's a brilliant film. Um, manager, you said, didn't you, Jane? Uh, I would go yeah. with Sir Bobby. I, I think you know. Um, I think I've spoken enough about him to make him have a big head, but he would be my my number one. Yeah. Goalkeeper. Mm -hmm. I always toy with this, but I think over the course of my time at Newcastle, I mean, David Seaman at England was brilliant, um, but I think Shay Given for me over the duration that I worked with Shay over a long time, knowing what he went through. Um, as a young player coming from Celtic, had the disappointment of not playing an FA Cup again with Rude Hullet. Me and me and Shay have played every single game, and then it comes to a cup final. Uh, and Rude being the Richard the Lionheart got Steve Plummett to come and tell us we weren't playing. Uh, but and Shay, the way he handled that and pushed that as a, a positive as I did, Shay given for me would be the number one. Uh, right back. Can I pick myself? Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, of course. That's it. Enough, <laughs> enough said. All the others are crap. Steve Watson. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pick myself. Yeah. It's the only time I get a game. So, yeah, I'll play. I'll, I'll, I'll put myself in there. No, I would give. Left back. Mm -hmm. Always go. Because uh, for me, Stuart Pearson, I mean, Bez as well was brilliant. Um, I know I got Stuart Pearce towards the end of his career, but I was lucky enough to play with Stuart with England as well a few times, just before Euro 96. Uh, and he epitomises, for me, what a professional player in the Premier League should be. You know, he, he loved the game, a student of the game. He, he wore his heart on his sleeve. He would do anything for you, um, could play. Uh, so Stuart would be my, my, my number one um, going into, into that. Uh, again, staying with that England side as well would be Tony Adams. Um, another a rock at the back um, that I would have. Um, Philip Albert next to him. He was so elegant on the ball. Again, sort of, you know, we have this phase now where you want centre halves on the ball. God knows how much he'd be worth now. If John Stones was worth 50 million, God, Philip would be worth about 80 because he was so cultured on the ball. I think we all remember that goal for Belgium mm. in the World Cup with the outside of his left foot and a great person as well. Such a, a, a good good man off the field. Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to go with three. Um, three mm. in midfield. Rob Lee being there for me. Um, I, I played with Rob again at Newcastle, England and then obviously a little with Derby as well. A sign of a, a good player is adapting his game. And we all knew Rob at the time was a box-to-box. -box. And then when he went into a holding midfield player, there was talk about him playing for England there. You know, um, he, he was brilliant. 
I'd love to put that Paul, people like Paul Scholes in there, you know, with England. But I didn't play enough with Paul uh, to say that. Uh, Speedo automatically would be in there. And Gaza. Um, oh, when before Euro 98, he oh. was on fire. Um, and and w- what a person as well, you know. He loved everybody and everybody loved him. But what a player he was, you know. That, I remember watching it again a little while ago about that goal against Scotland with Colin Hendry uh, in the Euro 96. He, he was brilliant. That, that period where, again, someone like Walter Smith and Terry Venables got the best out of him. He, he was sensational. Um, I would go with Ginola on that left-hand side. Good show. Um, and he'd have that freedom to float because he was that good and that good looking. So he could <laughs> do that. Um, and then I'd go with Les Ferdinand uh, as me, as, as maybe on that right-hand side as a, as a striker. And then, it goes without saying. Um, and I've left out someone like Peter Beardsley, uh, which would always get in my team. But actually, you know what? Because it, it it pissed David off. I, he'd go on the bench. <laughs> and i go two centre forwards with Les and Alan. I could, could not have a team without Alan Shearer. And Pedro would be in the hole. So I think okay. that would have come in. David can be on the, on, on the bench, um, which he doesn't like because then he'd want to ask for a move somewhere else. So I'll put him on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> I put them on the bench, but yeah, that would be my my eleven with the three in midfield, um, and then Pedro and 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 Les and and Alan Shearer as my partners up front. The hell on the side. That's the quite a team. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, quite it's a, been a good night out as well. It's a good night out. Not only a good, night, yeah. it's a good night out. I was going to say with um, having played with Gaza, um, what kind of you know what does he bring to a dressing room? You know the active that he had towards football and life. Everything, you know, it, people have this perception of Gaza of just being not a clown because I think it's disrespectful to say it to just being like silly and playing and getting out. He loved the game, you know, when it comes to being focused and being determination and, and doing the weights and listening to tactics. And his soccer IQ he was brilliant, yeah, he was a natural talent. Uh, and Foden's like that a little bit. It's the closest I've seen when Foden played in the under 17s. And he had that gather way of drifting past people without being exceptionally quick, but just went past people so so gifted. And Gaza was like that. And I said, I think people get lost up on the the Gaza that you know being silly and his face. Yet what a pl- what a player! What a what a student of the game! You know, there's no surprise that everybody tried to help him because everybody knew how much he loved the game, and that's where he was at most happiness. He was most happy when he was playing being out on the field and, you know, his ability to say little things. Even when I played with Gaza, he'd say, like, if you don't see anything, maybe come inside or you know, just little things about the game. Where I'm thinking, what's he worried about me for? You know, what was he worried about? What? And he was intrigued, like, him, Ince, Paul Ince and Ian Wright would sit down with me and, like, what's it like at Wimbledon? Like, Gaza would be intrigued about, yeah, Vinny grabbed my nuts, but what's it like? Yeah. We'd hear about John Hartson and uh, another tag. Yeah. Now we set his clothes on fire. He'd just come for a big money move from his man. <laughs> he missed a tough guy and we set his clothes on fire. <laughs> so, no, that was welcome to the crazy game. And he was incredible. Like, Gaz would love to, oh, that's brilliant. I love that. I love, you know, I love the way you do that. And, you know, he was just loved the game. So, I think it gets lost a little bit how much he was a student of the game and how he was intelligent with his football and how he played. So, yeah, he was phenomenal uh, with that, that period and, you know, that Euro 96 because we was in that bubble, well, I wasn't in the roster, but we was, we were still put, like me, Ray Parler, Phil Neville, we were still part of the squad that Terry wanted us to be around. And we was a little bit cocooned. But what it was doing to the country uh, was phenomenal. Mm. I know you're Welsh and you're not going to like this, but in, for England, it was great. You know, the Euro 96 was, was yeah. great. For us. Uh, it was all yeah. good. He was, he was the ultimate maverick. And obviously, we all wish him well. I know he's got his own personal demons that he's going through, but... Yeah, salute to Paul Gascoigne because he's an incredible person and an, an incredible footballer. His legacy, like you said, it shouldn't be tarnished. He shouldn't be known as the the clown. I think people should remember him as a fun guy who was just incredibly gifted. So we'll end it on a positive. Warren, thank you for coming, mate. We really, really appreciate it. Hopefully we can do it one day in San Diego. We'll do it live, you know, when all this, uh, <laughs> this pandemic is over. Or alternatively, if you want to come to Swansea, you're always more than welcome. I'd love to come to Swansea. I'd love to come to Swansea. But yeah, we can do it on the beach in San Diego. No problem. Done. 2022, (laughs) we'll be there. 
So we'll, we'll round it up now then, gents. Obviously, Warren, thank you for your time again. Um, to everybody watching, add Warren up on the socials, whether it's IG or it's on Twitter. You know, make sure you go and speak to him on there. Don't forget to add us up as well. Like the video so it goes into the algorithms and it gets seen by all the football fans. And don't forget to subscribe. And we will be back next time with some more news and some more views. Take care, people. Ciao for now.